Greetings all. Welcome to our webinar tied to the European Union General Data Protection Regulation. My name is Mike Boyle and I'm glad you were able to join us today. Within the GDPR, we, we start by talking about who it actually applies to. Might come up with some answers that might be surprising to some of you. What is the GDPR to begin with? When does it actually apply? Where will the actual enforcement take place? And that's very interesting as well. Why do we even have a GDPR? And then I'll go ahead and move on to a, a project approach suggestion for you. And then lastly, we'll go ahead and cover an actual example of a project that I worked on a number of years ago where we were very much involved with the data protection rules at that time. And this will give you an idea of the actual complexity to be found within the GDPR. And then lastly, we'll go ahead and close with questions and answers. So why do we have a general data protection regulation? Well, the first issue is clearly tied to the problems that we've had within the European Union in coming up with, with regulations or laws that are to be found within the 28 members of the EU. Up till now, we've been working with directives. And if, you will, if we look at the word directive, we're referring to something that should be done, but we're not actually saying that it, it must be done. And so the regulation, by setting it the, the confines within the European Union, settled in Brussels, basically states that the laws to be found within the GDPR are automatically applied in all 28 EU countries. And that's a massive change. This has been one of the big problems that we've had. And so by having regulations, we are able to, to harmonize the way that we actually approach the subject of data protection. And so that is very key. And that was the, the clear motivator. But before I move on to the actual elements to be found within the GDPR, I'd like to talk about the motivators. Why do we even have a global, or sorry, a general data uh, privacy regulation? And this goes back a number of years, I would say coming close to 40 years following EU history. Of, of the way that we've actually gone ahead and approached data protection here in the European Union, there are two basic tenets or two influencers that have driven the actual regulation and the, and the way that we've actually looked at data, data privacy within the EU. And they are tied to human rights and ease of business. What are we actually talking about with, with regards to human, uh, with human rights? That means that data privacy within the EU is considered to be a, a human right. And so that is not to be excluded from any resident of the EU. On the same token, the leaders within the European Union realize that it's very important to foster ease of business and so the whole idea was having harmonized regulations would mean that every business would know exactly what's expected of them and it would actually foster business. And so I think this has been very interesting. If I look at the conversations that I've seen online and the number of mails that I've received and I suspect a number of you have received, that you would never think that the second part, this ease of business, would ever fall into the equation, but it's extremely important. And I think it's important for you within the confines of this webinar to always think that we're always trying to figure out ways to foster business. The EU is not keen on limiting business, quite the opposite. And so keep that in mind when I go through my explanation through these various slides. As I mentioned, EU law supersedes member law. And so through the GDPR, it was not necessary for the individual member states to 
set up their own regulations because the GDPR automatically applied to all 28 countries. This document is huge. It has 173 recitals and 99 articles. Let me explain to you what we're actually talking about here. The recitals are referring to the interpretation of the law. How is, how is it to be understood? And then the 99 articles of the actual law per se. Something else I'd like to bring to your attention, something that I think is difficult for a number of Europeans to understand, the difference between common law and Napoleonic law. Now, within common law, we, we set regulations, but they're open to interpretation. Why? Because situations change and you want to be flexible. And so you allow a court of justice, so to speak. Certainly in our case with the European Union, a court of justice would be responsible for defining how do we interpret these laws. Napoleonic law is a little bit different. Napoleonic law states that this is the way that you are to interpret this law, which of course is very difficult when we're talking about 28 countries and we see a clear tendency within the EU to move more in the direction of having loose descriptions where you, have, you might have a conflict, and we've had a number of conflicts throughout the EU, uh, looking at... Um, even just concentrating on data privacy, all kinds of ways that countries interpret the laws, but somebody needs to have the power to make a decision. And that within the, the GDPR, that would be the European Court of Justice, which is located in Luxembourg. So again, we have 173 recitals, the theories and interpretations of the GDPR, and 99 articles of this law. So this document is huge. The, it took a number of years for the EU to get to the point of actually coming to the 173 recitals or the 99 articles. The actual implementation of the GDPR was on the 24th of May, 2016. And you might have noticed we haven't really talked about it too much until recently because the enforcement date is shortly upon us. That would be the 25th of May, this coming Friday. And that's when the law is to be enforced throughout the 28 member countries of the European Union. A point that I see not often discussed with regards to the GDPR and where it actually applies. And in fact, I've already only mentioned the 28 member countries of the EU, but actually there are 31 countries where the GDPR actually applies. We have within, Euro within the European confines, an organization called the European Economic Area where there are three members today, these are the ones that are denoted in green on the map that you're looking at right now. And, per, and I would love the opportunity to actually go ahead and perform a test to see how many of you can actually go ahead and recognize these countries, but I will spare you the agony of that. We'll go ahead and move on. Uh, the countries would be Iceland, Norway, in Liechtenstein. There's a fourth country that's involved. There's the country in the middle, which is red, and that would be Switzerland, that has also signed in a special agreement with the European Union, specifically tied to the GDPR, and the laws are equally effective in Switzerland as they are throughout the other 31 countries. And I'll come up with an example later on, specifically tied to data transfer, third country, the United States specifically, where Switzerland has set up their own provisions tied to the privacy shield. But again, that's something that I'll be covering a little bit later on. So what is the GDPR? Uh, within those 99 laws, we have 11 chapters. And of those 11 chapters, we have a, a number of main elements. And obviously, we don't have the time today to go into detail to discuss all of those various components. 
So I'll go ahead and concentrate on the main, main parts. The first one being tied to the rights of the data subject. That would be the individual whose privacy is to be adhered to. Interestingly enough, within the GDPR, we don't go into detail in defining what a data subject is, but it's considered to be a natural person, any individual who uh, might have personal information that needs to be protected. And that's very important because we're not talking about businesses, we're talking about individuals. The next part, which I'll cover more in detail, and obviously, sorry, backtrack, the, concerning the data subject on the next slide, I'll talk about the, the rights of the data subject more in detail. Then uh, the role of the controller and the processor, specifically tied to the processor, is very important to, to the GDPR. I have another slide we'll all go, where I will go into that more in detail. Transfers of personal data to third countries or international organizations. I will cover this subject as well, um, pretty high level to be honest, but I'll describe some of the co complexity tied to this. Independent supervisory authorities, and these would be the local authorities in the, in the, in the individual EU member states. I will cover that also more in detail. Cooperation and consistency, where we talk about uh, data privacy by design, data privacy by default. And then I'll allude briefly to the remedies, uh, liability, and penalties, because that's a clear differentiation between all of these directives of it I talked about earlier and this regulation, because the penalties are huge. And in fact, the penalties alone have gotten the most attention while we're at the subject might as well go into detail worst case scenario if someone if an organization does not adhere to the gdpr the maximum penalty would be 20 million euros or four four percent of your gross income whatever is more and so again these fines are huge they are not automatically assigned if for the most minor infraction but the EU was trying to pass on a message to everyone within the EU and outside the EU that they take data privacy seriously and I'll I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time on that again so let's go ahead and start with the, the actual rights of the data subject starting with recital 24, which would be tracking data subjects on the internet to analyze or predict the personal preferences, a preference that will trigger the regulation. What are they actually talking about here? They're talking primarily about cookies. Now, uh, cookies, of course, is a, a technical creation that has been with us for at least 20 years, if not more. And it's a way that we can actually go ahead and, and navigate or allow for navigation of our websites very often and allows us to track behavior of the individuals that actually enter our website. Now, from an EU perspective, they see all of this as being personal data. And so it's very important to understand what you're actually doing with the data and that the data is actually actually being abused. I think that's as far as I'd like to go ahead and take this point because there are other regulations within the EU that play a very important role here and all of this is, is being reevaluated, specifically tied to who has the the actual proof. You might have noticed on a number of websites today that you have to agree to accepting cookies. Well, this ties to this, this particular uh, part of the regulation. And in fact, I suspect moving forward, we will be changing. There will be less of a acknowledgement or perhaps we might still have the acknowledgement, but companies will not necessarily have to go ahead and submit all of this data to local authorities because the local authorities cannot keep up with it. So I, I would prefer not to concentrate on this particular element too much. Let's go ahead and move on to the others. Uh, putting individuals in control of their data 
via explicit consent. This is extremely important. What does this actually mean? This means that the, in, the data subject, as I mentioned earlier, is in charge of his or her own data. What does control actually mean? Control means that you can decide what can be used or what not can what cannot be used and you can you can decide that the data is no longer to be used we'll look at that a little bit more in, de in detail uh moving forward on the slide where i think we we understand these points a little bit more consent requested in return for goods and services in a take it or leave it no longer permissible what does that mean you know when you you enter a website and you see a long list of different functionalities i'm going to call them functionalities that the application would have access to well moving forward this is not truly permissible the idea would be that the data subject, you as an individual, should be able to pick and choose which ones are applicable or not. And you might have noticed recently that we've had a, a number of mails coming out from various websites or application providers that are explaining more in detail what they're offering and why they're offering it. And this kind of comes into the um, w one of the later points. But clearly, we as data subjects have the ability to go ahead and say, yes, we allow this. No, we do not allow this. The next point being parental consult consent, not a big one, uh, under 16 years of age. I can tell you right now, I live in Austria. And in fact, Austria has decided to make this law 13 years of age. So they've already made a differentiation to the GDPR. And, but that was already allowed within the regulation. The next point I think is very crucial in understanding the GDPR. And that would be that much more detailed transparency obligations are required. What are we actually talking about? If you're doing something, you need to tell the end user or the data subject. If you're changing something in the way that you use the data, you need to inform the data subject as well. If you have certain processes that affect the data subject, you need to inform the data subject. This is what this part of the regulation is actually referring to. Clear and plain language must be used so that it's clearly understood. Again, getting back to that description I was talking about earlier, that most people go ahead and just brush through because they don't understand and they, cl they click on I accept. That is no longer permissible within the GDPR. The idea is to remove this type of language and it's, it's very interesting within the GDPR where they, they talk about making sure that the text that you use is understandable by the data subject. That means if you write in a way that only a lawyer can understand, that is not permissible. Somebody off the street should be able to understand what you've actually gone ahead and put together. Another interesting point, this would be the last one on the slide, data portability. That means that you as a data subject within the GDPR have the right to go ahead and have a supply, I'm going to call them a supplier because you're receiving some sort of service from them, that they are able to go ahead and give you the data and if all the data that they have on you in a format that you can actually use machine readable is the the key component uh, within the sentence and that you can ask for your data be to be tr transferred to another supplier now this one hasn't really been tested and i'm very curious to see how this one works out but regardless this is part of the gdpr now, going on to some of the things I just talked about in the last slide, I found this one yesterday and thought it was quite interesting. So I wanted to go ahead and elaborate on that. So what are we looking at here on the screen? With GDPR, breaking up is so easy to do. Now, 
I suspect a number of you are in a similar situation like me, where you subscribe to a number of mailing lists, and sometimes you get to them, sometimes you don't. You even forget when you went ahead and subscribed to the mailing list. Well, one of the parts of the GDPR, which is very important, is this is a so-called grandfather clause. And what that means is, okay, so you've captured the data of the data subjects. Well, you need to go back to them and reaffirm, based upon the rules of the GDPR, whether your their data can still be used. And so that's why we've been receiving a number of mails where these various suppliers are asking us, do you still want to go ahead and subscribe to our mailing list? And very often when you read the text, they'll go ahead and say, if you do not overtly consent, in other words, say yes, that you want to continue receiving the mailing list, they will automatically be cut off because they're, they're reading the GDPR very uh, literally, which means that for a number of businesses, their mailing list will be decreased immensely an effect of the GDPR. So let's go ahead and move on to the business duties. We've covered the rights of the data subject. Now we move on to the, to the businesses. Accountability. Now, in comparison to the directives I talked about earlier, would have been set up by the EU, uh, the GDPR does not enforce for companies to actually go ahead to supply information to the local authorities. But if it's called up, if it's required in some fashion, the companies need to be able to provide it. So this is really what we're covering in this part, the accountability, demonstrating compliance and being transparent. Transparency we talked about in the last slide. Compliance means, are you holding to the rules? And within those new responsibilities, implementation of data protection policies. And I mentioned a phrase earlier, data protection by design, data protection by default. Here we're talking about coming up with systems where data protection will automatically happen. That's the design part. And you set, and you arrange for settings so that the, the data protection will, will not be flawed. And of course, when we talk about systems, and for those of you that are coming from the IT realm, you know all too well what kind of complications we have here, looking at authentication, authorization. There are a lot of things that we need to go, go ahead and think about within our, our systems architecture to make sure that we, we, uh, we stay within the guidelines of data protection by design, data protection by default. And so really what we're talking about is Within the second point, implementation of data protection policies is that we're able to go ahead and hold to these two rules. And that is a great segue into the, the next line, which I pretty much described, data protection by design and data protection by default. Uh, record keeping obligations by controllers and pr processors. And again, I'll be talking about controllers and processors much more in detail in a later slide. Cooperation with supervisory authorities by controllers and processors. These supervisory authorities, I'll, I'll be covering more in detail, but just as a um, brief description for you now, we're talking about local authorities within the EU member states that are responsible for enforcing the GDPR. And that has become very, very interesting. And I'll go into a little bit more in detail once we've gone ahead and reached that slide. The next point, carrying out data protection impact assessments. Here, I, due to time constraints, I don't go into detail looking at the DPIAs. There are uh, data protection impact assessments where we're trying to understand the risk uh, that we have within our operations and how we, we come up with ways to... Uh, um, perform solutions if indeed there's a data breach. I'll, I'll talk about the data breach rules, uh, but there was, uh, unfortunately for this webinar, there's not enough time for the DPIAs, but it's also, it's very important. 
uh, prior consultation with DPAs. These are the data protection authorities. They, they are the local authorities within the EU member states. Again, I'll be covering that more in detail. Within this, this particular sentence, we're talking about if you are dealing with a lot of data and the situation could be sensitive if there's a breach, you are to consult with your local DPAs. Basically, that's what we're talking about. And we'll talk about the data protection officers. Clearly, in that situation, we would need a data protection officer. And then let's cover the last point within the slide. Mandatory data protection officers, the DPOs, for controllers and processors for the public sector and big data processing all uh, activities. And there are certain rules within the GDPR that, uh, and this is very much based upon the local interpretation. I'll give you an example of when a data protection officer is actually required. We've come up with a law. It's supposed to be enforced coming Friday, but um, the real test is going to be how a lot of a lot of the provisions within the GDPR, the 99 laws, and I would go into the 173 recitals, how they're going to be interpreted by the various countries. Okay, so let's move on to the supervisory authorities under the GDPR. These are the data pr protection authorities that I referred to earlier. So that means you have 28 right now, representing the 28 EU countries. The, um, in this, this has been very interesting. So we have laws that apply, we have one set of laws that apply to all 28 countries. And with, and Brussels more or less decided there, there's a certain pouvoir or a, a liberty that the countries have, but the real key is how they actually go ahead and enforce these rules. And we've already seen a different way of looking at things depending upon where you are in the EU. Let me give you an example. I live in Austria, as I mentioned, and Austria came out a couple weeks ago basically stating that they will not start immediately enforcing the GDPR with the penalties, but they will concentrate on education and informing the local businesses how the GDPR works and making sure that it's, it's adhered to. Uh, Germany came out with something similar last week. That has been, and here I don't have a complete overview of all 28 countries, but I, I spend a fair amount of time watching various webinars to better understand what's ho happening in the, the other 26 countries within the EU. And they have not been so overt in stating that they're going to take more of a supervisory role instead of an enforcement role. But one thing is very important to notice here. When they talk about supervision, they're talking about their own companies. In other words, if you're in Austria, Austrian companies, or if you're in Germany, we're talking about Germany countries. Or if you, um, that's not necessarily referring to non-EU uh, companies. And I think this is really, really important to emphasize here that if you are a non-EU entity, in other words, you, you're running a non-EU business, um, you are you could be on somebody's radar screen, especially if you are running business where uh, data transfer hasn't been authorized by the EU. Uh, I'll cover that a little bit more in detail later on. And so it's very important to understand what these regulations are and what are the repercussions if you don't hold to these um, uh, to these regulations. A little bit more information on the structure of the supervisory authorities. These are these um, data protection authorities I talked about on the last slide. There are 28 all told, representing the 28 EU members. They are located in uh, Strasbourg, and they are responsible for coordinating how the GDPR is actually interpreted and enforced. And of course, any uh, additional changes that might take place, I'm afraid there's not enough time to go into detail on that. But one thing's for sure, it's very important to understand 
the, the power of the local data protection authorities. Let me give you an example to show you how important this is. Stay with the example, I'm in Austria. As a data subject in Austria, a typical person performing, buying something, I, if I have a complaint with any company, whether it's in Austria, whether it's within the EU, or another business that is I'm dealing with, I am to report that to the local Austria authorities. And if you, depending upon where you're actually sitting, if you find yourself in a similar situation, then you will need to go ahead and report that to your local data protection authority. As I mentioned earlier, there's a big discrepancy in how these laws are being interpreted. Let me just give you an example right now. Uh, something that I ran across, very interesting. I'll be talking about this a little bit more in detail, the data protection officer. But one of the questions that we've had is, um, so when are you, when do you need to have a data protection officer? When are you compelled to have one? When do you need to have one legally? And here we see a difference between Germany and Austria. In Austria, they will say, if you have 20 people within your organization that are, are, are working with data, then you, after 20 people, you need to have a data protection officer. In Germany, it's nine. And so there's a huge difference depending upon where you are, how these laws will actually be deployed. And so a lot of what we need to consider is not necessarily where we are right now, but how these laws will be interpreted after the 25th of, of May. But the, the, the data protection authority in the countries are very, very important. Let's move on to the next slide. Again, another subject where we don't have enough time to really go into detail within this webinar, but I'd like to go ahead and talk about the, these, these three roles. Starting from the, start in the middle, the data controller. Who is the, are the authority within your company to make sure that everything tied to the GDPR has been taken care of, to put it very bluntly. In other words, that you understand what the GDPR is about, that you, that you arrange for processes tied to data privacy by design, data privacy by default, and that you hold the ultimate um, accountability if something goes wrong. Case in point, there is a provision within the GDPR if indeed you have a data breach. In other words, if somebody gets into your data, that you need to inform the, the local data protection authority within 72 hours, and you're also to um, inform, when in doubt, make sure that you inform the actual end users or the data subjects of the actual data breach. You are, you are in, um, compelled or you're enforced to by the GDPR to go ahead and, and, and follow these rules. And that falls within the data controller. Let's go ahead and move on to the data processor. The data processor is the person who is to, or the, the institution, the organization, that is to perform the processing for the data controller. Some inter interesting rules tied to the data controller. That is, the data processor is not part of your organization. So in other words, uh, we're only talking about external companies. And this is where it gets really interesting. Let's think about the way that business works today. And I'm, ta I'm looking at a number of years of experience where uh, I've lived with this with the situation where I might be dealing with certain data, but I hand off this data to somebody else to actually go ahead and perform the data processing. And very often they have not been part of the EU. The, the data processor in this particular case needs to be uh, needs to receive clear instructions from the data controller, and they need to hold to those uh, rules. If there's a data breach, 
The data processor is to inform the data controller, and the data controller informs the data protection authority, the local data protection authority. If the data processor does not adhere to the data controller's rules, the data processor by default becomes a data controller, has be, is automatically become accountable. So for, for any of you that are working as a data processor in some fashion, this is extremely important because you, on the one hand, you need to be able to ask for all of this information from a data controller. That's their responsibility. You do not want to take this responsibility because it's not in your interest. Secondly, if there is a breach, you need to inform the data controller. There's no sense in covering it up because you will be held accountable. Thirdly, um, if, if there are rules that cannot be followed and you're a data processor, and if you do not highlight this to the data controller and you try to solve it the best you can, you're accountable. So you do not want to put yourself in that situation. This is all very key. And I think within the GDPR, this, the, data, the change in the data processor is very important. So that would be covering on a very high level the relationship between a data controller and a data processor. Let's go ahead and move up to the data protection officer. Data protection officer, as I mentioned, using the example of Austria and Germany, could look a little bit different. Uh, the idea is if you're dealing with a lot of data, you want to come up with a data protection officer. A data protection officer is not sitting in IT. I know we've been talking about data and you think this would be an IT issue. The data protection officer does not sit in IT. I'll come up with an example later on where we talk about how we approach a GDPR project. And I raise an open question to you, something you could think about, and you, maybe you might want to pose uh, this in the questions and answers later on. Are all processes that you have within your organization, are they all automated? Is there data that's being managed manually? Can data be managed manually? Do you have a manual default if the automation doesn't work? Well. And I'd be highly surprised if, if any of those three points I just raised don't apply, well then you need to come up with ways that you deal with the non-automated data. And because of the liability of the GDPR, as I mentioned earlier, 20 million euros or 4% of your gross returns, whatever is higher, so in other words, it could be much higher than the 20 million, that is very important for a CEO. So conventional wisdom tells us that a data protection officer should be reporting directly to a CEO, setting the rules, making sure that the rules are being adhered to, uh, establishing the governance, et cetera, et cetera. These would be the general responsibilities of a data protection officer. Data protection officer does not hold the accountability. That's still with the controller. But the data protection officer acts as a trusted advisor to the CEO to make sure that you're doing everything correctly. Uh, it should be neutral, and that's extremely important to make sure that you can properly enforce the GDPR. Let's move on to the next slide. I talked briefly about transfer of data to non-EEA, in other words, European Economic Area entities. And one of the hot topics within this subject is, is tied to the Privacy Shield. Now, the Privacy Shield is an agreement between the United States and the European Union and how data is to be transferred from one side to the, of the Atlantic to the others. And of course, uh, is very often the case, um, it's not quite optimal specifically for the Europeans. And 
especially tied to the GDPR. There is a different data set in the United States tied to data privacy, which is a little bit difficult to, to translate. European Union finds data privacy to be important. Think about one of the, the, one of the first slides that we had in this webinar talking about human rights. EU looks at data privacy as being human right, which is not necessarily the case in other parts of the world. And so the EU and the United States have tried to move forward with another, an agreement um, called the Privacy Shield, where they, you go ahead and um, try to come up with safeguards that match the GDPR as much as possible. And I just took a screenshot from the Privacy Shield site run out of the United States, and this would be tied to companies in the U.S. Have, that have um, that have subscribed to the Privacy Shield, and it shows which ones are active, as you can see on your screen, and which rules actually apply. And I thought it was very interesting in preparation for a number of things tied to GDPR. I found this one where you would have an EU-US privacy shield, but obviously Switzerland has already established their own privacy shield, probably tied to the EU rules, I suspect, but they've come up with their own agreement with the United States, which actually, when you think about it, makes sense. One last point I'd like to raise tied to third country, uh, non-EU countries that have already been approved for data transactions. The list is very short. I wouldn't be able to quote um, off the top of my head the actual countries where the data trans transmission has, has been approved, but I would say it's probably something along the lines of 10 countries. Um, and some of the countries that would be crucial uh, are not on that list. And so within the GDPR, you as a, as a, uh, a company having a data controller functionality would need to go ahead and that um, whoever you deal with as a data processor holds to the GDPR. And that's basically the, the way that we get around that if we're dealing with business that is not on the GDPR um, whitelist. Okay, um, as I mentioned, the, I wanted to give you one approach, and I'll have to make this very brief because we're, we're running out of time a little bit, uh, to describe how can you go ahead and approach a GDPR project. And so I came up with a, um, some, had some interesting discussions here locally uh, where I automatically thought, well, we take the top-down approach. We look at all our processes, and we try to see where, where data is actually is exchanged. And this individual came and pre presented uh, the approach a little bit different. I thought it was quite interesting. He used ITIL, which is the Information Technology uh, Information Library, which you might be, some of you might be familiar with. It's a certification that actually you can, um, Knowledge Head is also very much involved in. And so we use the components of ITIL to go ahead and manage that process. And so without going into all of these various um, labels that you find on your screen right now, I'll go into this more high level. Let's concentrate on service operations. What is service operations? Service operations is the way that we do business today. So the real question would be to look at the, the, the processes that we have within service operations, looking at it from an IT perspective. Uh, to what degree we cover the rules data protection by design and data protection by default in our existing processes. And so the idea is to understand our current state or uh, as is, which would be service operations. So once we've gone ahead and established the current state or the as is, then we move on to the service design part, which is actually uh, understanding what gaps we have and planning to get past the gaps. And that would be the service design part. Once we've covered the service design, which is, is planning for the transition, then we move on to the service transition part and actually closing the gaps. 
So we've identified the gaps within the as is. We've planned to cover the gaps within the design. The transition, transition phase actually does cover the gaps. But of course, we live in a dynamic environment. So we need to go ahead and check, check this com uh, constantly. So we need to take in this additional part with the NITIL, which would be the continual service improvement to make sure that we are always covering the data protection, going back to the protection by design, uh, protection by default. This should be part of our change management process, et cetera, et cetera. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have this problem tied to the manual parts that are not necessarily listed within ITIL. So we need, we use the, within this approach, we, we use the ITIL information as a benchmark, and then we go to the other touch points in the organization and try to figure out, so where else are we also dealing with data? How are we dealing with the data? Uh, what are the safeguards tied to dealing with the data? Maybe this might be the opportunity for us to go ahead and automate a lot of this manual um, information that we're dealing with. And so as you can very well imagine, this could be a very long, laborious process. But it needs to be done, and especially for, uh, for those of you who are watching that are in the EU, EU you have no choice. I suspect a lot of you are not, some of you are not in the EU, but you're dealing with EU residents. So that means that these laws apply to you. And I think this is the big takeaway that I'd like to pass on to you. Even if you're not in the EU, these rules apply to you. And so if you don't adhere to them, don't be surprised if, um, depending upon how severe the rules are not being adhered to that maybe your access to EU residents might be curtailed. And so that's a very serious message. Think about it from a different perspective. So if you have a web shop and you're not able to handle business from EU residents anymore, that could be severe. What if you have an IT business and you're working with data processing? Well, that's equally severe. So I think one of the big takeaways, even if you're sitting in the EU and you're thinking about where you're doing business, one of the, one of the problems I see in the conversations tied to GDPR today is that everybody's looking at it from a local perspective. In other words, if I'm in Austria, I'm looking at how Austrians do business. But the fact is we live in a global environment and we're dealing with people in numerous countries. So we need to be thinking about all of these things that I'm talking about today. And la the last example then, um, we'll probably extend a little bit past the, um, the uh, cutoff in two minutes time because I want to give you the opportunity to ask questions. Came with examples, very complicated. And so I'll make it quick, uh, not to explain everything you're looking at on your screen, but I want to show you the complexity of dealing with GDPR, specifically tied to the, the um, data controllers and the data processors. This is coming out of business travel. And it's one of those things that I dealt with, uh, it's a domain I dealt with for a number of years. And I never really thought too much about it, but that was a number of years ago. I do not deal with this domain directly anymore, although I understand um, <laughs> it hasn't changed too much. But the fact is, there's a, a huge level of complexity. And I'm going to go ahead and go through this very quickly just to raise some questions. How complex the architecture can be in understanding the data controller and the data processor. So you see this one slide right here. Uh, the credit card is a master. Uh, that means that the, the credit card as a master is clearly a data controller functionality. And, you, and they are responsible for the data that they collect. The problem here is that they don't collect all the data that you need. So when you, when you start, and I'm looking, at, I came up with a model from a client implementation. Uh, so you take in this data from the credit card company. To, and then you bring it into a database, a, a profile application, where you use the credit card data as base data. 
and you need for the the travelers or the end users to augment this data because of course within credit card data you're not going to know what kind of seat assignments you like you don't you're not going to know what kind of um uh, seat preference you might have or maybe you might be you might have some meal preference less um applicable today but it was at one time certain contact details in case of emergency should be applied just to give you some examples and within this model we have uh, a mid-office system which was basically uh, taking the data and bring it in um, taking transactions and bringing them in, down to invoicing. I don't want to go into too much detail. I just want to go ahead and explain the complexity. We have an online booking tool so that the individual travelers can book. They will take the data from the profile tool and that will be the basis so that they can make reservations. And we have a global distribution system. But in any case, we have a number of touch points here where it's not really quite clear who is the data controller and who is the data processor. In fact, you are going to have multiple controllers and multiple processors, processors within an architecture. And this is a very good example. You will have um, the, the business travel agency that will have some data controlling functionality. When I was involved in the business, the idea was to go ahead and push this on to back to the clients that the clients would get the consent from the travelers. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to hold on to their data within the profile app. But I tend to think moving forward with GDPR, that will not be so easy. I think the the business travel companies will need to think about what their actually, actual role is. But we have one, two, three, four, five... Just on this slide, I see five different touch points that are probably data controllers and data processors. And so again, I use this as an example. In our particular case, when I was involved, uh, we actually had a data protection officer. This was back in 2002. These, um, the in intentions of laws have been around for a long time, and we were enforcing them back in 2002. We had somebody who was responsible. And today, it's even more pronounced. So this is just to give you an idea of, of how complicated this type of setup can actually be. And I think without further ado, move on to see if we have any questions. Okay, so we have uh, Lawrence who's posed a question. We use a US appointment software that asks for data that a writing center requested so that we can report to our administration about who was coming in and for what purposes. Okay, uh, first point here, Lawrence, um, and something I didn't really highlight in my presentation, but is very important, so I'm glad you, you raised this question. If you collect data, you need to be able to show why you're collecting it. And the idea is that you do not collect information without being able to prove what you're doing with it. So getting to your example, when we're talking about a uh, report to our administration about who was coming in and for what purposes, then you need to show what, those, um, what that data set is and why you're actually collecting it, just as, as an um, an opportunity to go ahead and highlight. We use the data for improvement of our services. Um, that probably needs to be uh, more clearly identified what service improvement actually is, but also that we can contact the user to confirm an appointment by email. Okay, that's a very clear purpose, why you're collecting the data. In this particular case, again, you want to make sure within the GDPR that you're informing the end user what data you're collecting and why you're collecting it, and you need to get a, a, an explicit consent from those end users. That's really key here. Or remind them that an incoming, okay, this is all the purpose of the data, that you can contact the user to confirm an appointment by email or remind them of an upcoming appointment or to inform them that they have missed an appointment and of the consequences. Right. Okay. So these are the uh, to ex This is all tied to the actual appointment. Understanding is it going to take place? Yes. No. And what happens if you do, if it doesn't take place or if you uh, don't hold to um, to the rules tied to the appointment? We get their mobile numbers. Okay. So it's a clear uh, piece of data uh, and the reasons why you collect it. That one's clear. Um, 
get you sorry for everybody who's not reading what I'm reading on the screen. We get their mobile numbers so also that we can call them if we have missed an appointment or to inform them of the tutor's absence it, uh, illness. Okay, that one's clear. It's understanding why you collect the data and for what purpose. What should we worry about? Do we need to offer them opt-outs? Yes, you do need to off offer them opt-outs, but of course, you have to understand when you offer them opt-outs, then basically you are saying that there are certain parts of your service they cannot take into advantage, uh, take, um, uh, um, take advantage of. So you need to be very clear in how you spell out this information to the end user. Uh, one, give them the opportunity, but they need to understand what service they will not have if you do not collect this data. The, uh, can we justify not accommodating those that do not agree? Yes, I would say, well, I mean, this is always a... a this is always a, a tricky one because we're talking about business and we're talking about revenue. And so, uh, yes, the, I think the real question is, are you, can you afford to just go ahead and say, well, we don't need your business? This is where it gets a little bit tricky and it's all part about uh, making sure that people understand why you're collecting the data. And I think that we're going through a huge learning curve here in the EU Understanding the the data that we receive, you asked a follow-up question, Lawrence. What about those that follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram? Okay, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram are data controllers. You are not a data controller there. And, and furthermore, it's public data. That's something I didn't mention in the presentation, also very important, that public data does not necessarily apply, it does not apply to the GDPR. Now, this is where it gets very, very tricky, what is public data. But in this particular case, case it's very clear, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram are the data controllers. You are not a data controller, therefore you don't have to worry about it. You do not, do not hold that data. Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram hold the data. So they are the data controllers. Okay, so uh, let's go on to Amanda, who posed the question, can you advise what restrictions, guidelines are there on companies when recording conversations with customers for training purposes? <laughs> That's a very good question. There, um, again, another point I wasn't able to cover. Um, Theoretically, this has nothing to do with the GDPR. It has everything to do with the Telecommunications Act within the EU, where you are informed to go ahead and um, advise the, the data subject in this particular case that something's going to be recorded. Give them the opt-out if they did not want it to be recorded, that it's not recorded. And so... Uh, Within our the course that we're we're holding on on GDPR, this is by by no stretch of the imagination a full blown course in an hour. Uh, but we talk about these things more in detail. Uh, but as a high level, um, it's not a recommendation. Just as a as a comment, I guess best better said. And I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I should go ahead and state. Uh, please don't look at this as being legal advice. But um, you might want to go, this would not, in my personal opinion, this would not be part of the GDPR. This would be part of the Del Telecommunications Act. This webinar was a precursor to give you an idea of what the GDPR is about. Um, and to more or less highlight that we're ro rolling out some courses um, through Knowledge Hut tied to going more into detail about the GDPR. And obviously, there are some difficulties within a short webinar like this to, to, to go into detail. Um, as you can see with the inf on the information on your screen, there's a lot to cover, uh, which it, I didn't even scratch the surface. Therefore, I mean, I was very thankful for the questions because that allowed me to go ahead and highlight some things that I, um, I didn't plan to highlight so I can bring some added value. But... This is extremely complicated. And so when we think about the problems, if you are dealing with companies or better said data subjects outside of your comp uh, country, if you're, de if you're outside of the EEA and dealing with EU residents, if you are a data controller or a data processor, um, if you're trying to better understand how do I set up a mindset tied to data 
privacy by default, sorry, data privacy by design, data privacy by default. The idea was to come up with a course that allowed you to have a much more of a deeper dive in what the GDPR is about and all the, uh, also to allow you the opportunity to talk more in detail about your specific cases so that we can actually come up with, with uh, more viable solutions for you. Again, I'd like to thank you all for attending our webinar today. I very much appreciate it. Um, as you can see, this is a very complicated subject. And so um, I tried the best I could to cover a lot of detail in a short period of time. I appreciate you actually going ahead and attending. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.